Okay, to tie it all together, let's examine some of the last effects here with inflammation. I've already mentioned insulin and its role involving with protein turnover, more so again on the anti-catabolic side. But the, in, the inflammation signal is a critical signal in its own right, where inflammation beyond causing insulin resistance creates a direct disruption at the muscle. Now, I'd mentioned some cytokines like TNF-alpha and C-reactive protein, both of which are coming, by the way, from hypertrophic fat cells, and they can interfere with this signaling. But when they come to the muscle, the muscle will receive that inflammatory signal. Part of that signal will be the activation of what's called transcription factors. These are master regulator genes that when they're turned on, they're going to go on and, and turn on uh, a host of other effects within a cell. This includes things like NF-kappa B or STAT, S-T-A-T-3, which increase the expression of muscle-specific enzymes that tag muscle protein for destruction. So to be clear, you'd have an inflammatory signal, say coming from a big fat cell, and that tells the muscle cell to start basically tagging muscle proteins for destruction. And as they get destroyed, you're having this in dramatically enhanced catabolism where the muscle cell is just leaking out its, its amino acids. And this is a reason why in insulin-resistant individuals, especially people with type 2 diabetes, you will uniformly see elevated levels of branched-chain amino acids. It's not that the branched-chain amino acids are causing the muscle insulin resistance. It's that they are a consequence of the muscle insulin resistance. Now, this topic right here introduces an interesting aspect to supplementation with omega-3. Omega-3s are known to be anti-inflammatory. Perhaps some of the evidence that supports the use of omega-3 in promoting muscle growth in humans is because of the anti-inflammatory effects. But to start to wrap all of this up, this is why interventions that improve insulin sensitivity, like resistance training, weight loss, and omega-3 supplements are effective at restoring some anabolic signaling. They don't just improve glucose metabolism, but they can improve muscles' ability to respond to these anabolic signals. Again, both by enhancing the anti-catabolic aspect, so helping the muscle stay where we want it, but also enhancing the responsiveness to the signal. So let's just really wrap up with some uh, practical solutions uh, because anabolic resistance is reversible. Even in 70-year-olds, you can. there's evidence to show that with resistance training, you restore some stimulus. And indeed, resistance training remains the most potent anabolic stimulus. If you are listening to this, I'm afraid you are going to need, I can hear your groan from here. You don't want to get up and do something. You have to get up and do something. Changing your diet will not be enough. And the good news is even in older adults, some high volume or some high intensity resistance training, which is relative. Remember, it's relative. It's not you doing what you did when you were 25. It's you doing what you can do now. But that is the strongest signal, that mechanical loading will activate mTOR more than anything else. Then, of course, protein intake matters tremendously. You want to get leucine-rich proteins and, as the evidence suggests and as unpopular as it may sound, do not waste your time or stomach space on plant protein. Don't waste your time. That Van Loon study made it very, very clear. Animal proteins are critical in older adults. Young people can get away with these inferior cruddy proteins, although I'd still say why waste your time and money on this? Focus on animal protein. It is the best to help overcome anabolic resistance. And there could be a case for a multi-ingredient um, approach. Uh, a recent randomized control trial showed that combining whey protein and casein, both of which are proteins from dairy, combining that with creatine and vitamin D and calcium and omega-3 improved lean mass and strength in older obese individuals. So that's the double whammy. They're old and they're obese. So some of these are going to work synergistically. I, I am an advocate of creatine and I'm an advocate of vitamin D3. I think both of those ought to be a part of your intervention for improving uh, anabolic resistance. Creatine not only directly activates muscle protein gene expression, the genes that 
di directly feed into um, muscle protein, uh, but also uh, vitamin D helps. Uh, it kind of greases the skids, which is appropriate because it's itself a fatty molecule. Also, there are some other molecules, um, one called hydroxy beta methylbutyrate, HMB. It's been shown to boost muscle protein synthesis in older adults by up to 20%. And you can also have some other more modest muscle stimuli like these electrical, these e-stim devices, but they're not going to be as good as lifting weights. Now, one final comment would be um, things like peptides like BPC-157. There are more and more peptides that are gaining some traction. It's still a very young field, although I think we have reason to be quite optimistic. It wouldn't surprise me if in the very near future we have a host of well-studied, researched uh, peptides, peptide therapies that will help with muscle mass, particularly in aging. But of course, ultimately, the best approach is going to be multifactorial involving resistance exercise, smart um, supplementation and nutrition.